then, as the market evolved in the, at the end of 2017, actually my students were teasing me. <laughs> Joe, do you still like Tim Bits? <laughs> you know, look at the price. <laughs> so I have to tell them market is irrational, right? <laughs> and You're right. in the beginning of this year, they started asking me the same question again. Hey, you told us buy low and sell high. <laughs> And right now the price is so low. So. so anyway, there is coffee. I think yes. Uh, if anyone would like coffee before we start, it looks like there's coffee at the back. So please help yourself. And there's no timbits. <laughs> it, it looks like there's cookies. Timbits is not healthy. They're not healthy. Yeah. Crypto cryptocurrencies aren't healthy either, but. We'll see. Um, does anyone actually uh, hold any cryptocurrencies? Great. Which ones do you hold? Um, what, what do you own? Uh, XRP. XRP? Okay. Ripple? Yeah. Okay. And how do you actually hold it? Um, like I have a hardware wallet. Do you have a hard wallet? So yeah. is it on your phone or do you have a, 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 a USB key? Uh, no, USB. A USB key? Good. What do you own? Oh, uh, Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, uh, Golem, EOS, uh, what else? Litecoin. Great. We go with maybe 10 or 15. 10 or 15? Yeah. And for how long have you been old, uh, owning them? Uh, we'll start out in 2013. 2013, okay, so you're, well, you're way in advance of most people. Okay, great. And uh, yourself? Uh, I own Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, and Stellar. Okay. Yes. Also a big portfolio. And around the same time? Uh, 2014, I got 2014. And yourself? Uh, Bitcoin, Ether, and EOS now. Okay. And can I ask the, the, the four of you, how do you actually hold your, your, your cryptocurrencies? Uh, well, our Ether, we hold in a wallet and so on an exchange, unfortunately. And uh, with the more or less kind of... Uh, common ones we hold on exchange, like Poloniex or something like that. Okay, nothing with Quadriga, I hope. Uh, yeah, we've you uh, had some with Quadriga? Have, not a lot. Not, not a lot, okay. We don't hold a lot on exchange. Because, uh, you know, many people might have been following the story that's been in the Global Mail about this this electronic exchange called Quadriga, which is, um, it's, it's closed down, it's gone into receivership, and uh, the the founder and CEO is uh, maybe may have passed away, uh, may have not passed away. It's unclear, but two hundred fifty million dollars of cryptocurrency is uh, missing, and it's not clear if it's actually encrypted and on his laptop or whether the money has been has been moved. Um, so there's been it's a good news and a bad news story because. The good news is it shows that the encryption behind these cryptocurrencies is very secure. Uh, the bad news is, is that unfortunately it shows that there's a lot of moral hazard uh, when there's a financial intermediary between what is effectively supposed to be a peer-to-peer -peer system and there's now a lot of people who've been using sort of financial intermediaries that are unregulated and um, with, uh, you know, it's hard for you as, as someone who holds the currencies to verify how how uh, financially sound they are, and that's, um, that's been proven with Quadriga. Um, okay, so I, I actually run a, a research center at Ivy called the Digital Banking Lab, and it, it was funded by a gift from Scotiabank, but we're independent of Scotiabank. But the idea is that uh, what we're talking about today, cryptocurrencies, is part of a, a smaller disruption that's going on across financial services. Now, how many people here are doing their banking on their phone? So I, um, how many people are doing investing on their phone? Or, or maybe through RoboAdvisor? Which, which do you use, Joe? Uh, which service do you use? Intact or broker. Okay, and you're doing your, your investing through Intact? Yeah. Okay, and which, which service are you using? Mike. For, uh, I'll, sorry, use I'll, I'll ask you your name so that- It's Mike. Mike, yeah. Mike, which-, uh, which Oh, I use the TD Waterhouse through my bank. TD Waterhouse, yeah. okay. Or whatever, um, it's the, whatever it's called. No. Many people are, uh, are increasingly doing their, their banking and financial services online, and this area is now known as FinTech or financial technology. I'm gonna start by talking about FinTech overall, 
and before drilling down and looking at cryptocurrencies and then taking a step back and looking at blockchain, which is the, the distributed ledger that's behind uh, cryptocurrencies. Okay. My, my, my bottom line message is that FinTech is basically something that is not going away. It's, it's, uh, it's basically a new way of, of accessing your financial services. And that blockchain has many, many applications beyond simply cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is simply one asset that's now being recorded on a blockchain, but there's also many different use cases across different industries, including agriculture. So what this picture shows is um, is the number of references to the word fintech in the media, as recorded by um, oh, this. This is an interesting pointer. I've never seen that before. Uh, I'll, I'll try not to point it straight. And you can see that basically uh, the number of, of of references has gone up exponentially in recent years, and in particular post the financial crisis, 2007-2008. Um, the word fintech is, is not the only one that's received a lot of attention. Now I'm just looking at the period from 2008 to, to present, and this blue line is the references to fintech, and you can see that it's, it's continued its upward climb. But the red is actually references to Bitcoin, and you see that the media really only started paying attention to Bitcoin around 2013, and the yellow are references to blockchain. And what's interesting, is that in the most recent year, 2018, you can see that the references to blockchain are now even exceeding the references to Bitcoin as people are starting to understand this technology that's underlying Bitcoin. The, what's gotten um, people confused is that there are a variety of businesses and business models that fit under the, the label of FinTech. FinTech itself is, is not well defined. I should have said um, FinTech I use fintech to refer to the digital delivery of financial services. So that would include uh, things like uh, deposits, payments, uh, wealth management, but it does not include e-commerce. Okay? So any commerce online would not be considered financial services, even though there may be a payments or financial services option behind that. Um, the, the key differentiator here is that rather than uh, online banking, which has been around for quite a while, it's, it's really been the mobile phone and access to your financial services on your mobile phone and uh, over the internet as two alternative channels for distribution of financial products and services. So the, the variety of businesses, many people are involved with personal finance. You may be actually using different apps. Uh, who here actually uses apps like Microsoft Money or Quicken to track their finances. Nobody does because it's so painful to do it. Okay? But there are services that will do that, allow you to get a sort of a comprehensive view of your finances. Payments and billings is one. Uh, any, does anyone here use Apple Pay? Interesting, not a lot of take up of Apple Pay. How about uh, Samsung Pay or uh, Union Pay out of China or uh, WePay? We no? Okay, I, I wondered if Helen and, and Joe might be using them. Um, there's there's a, a lot of wealth management applications available, which uh, perhaps the biggest one that people have seen advertising for is Wealth Simple. And that category is typically called robo-advisors because they're computer algorithms that are investing money. Um, um, there's a big use case for money transfers and, and in particular remittances with people sending money to try and avoid the high fees and the low, the, the sort of the slow, uh, the, the long time it takes to actually transfer money overseas. Um, and you can see here that blockchain in, in a field which is now being called crypto economics or crypto assets is, is the, um, one of, of many different business lines. So I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about uh, blockchain and crypto, but before I do, I wanted to sort of, you know, talk about FinTech in general. This, this chart basically shows a number of, uh, each of these, these small colorful boxes is a logo of a startup. And this is already circa 2017. It shows startups across different business lines where here is infrastructure in the bottom. This is banking and payments, investments, and insurance. And what I want you to take away from this is that there's been a huge a number of new businesses starting up in the area of FinTech. Um, and they've been receiving billions of dollars of investment, of equity investment. But what, what surely can't be true is that they're all going to be successful. 
so there was a massive amount of money that was invested in, in basically people who had an idea and the technology. But a lot of these businesses will ultimately fail because that's just the nature, the nature of, of startups. You can see that from KPMG, they've been keeping track of the, the dollars invested in fintech globally. And you know, from uh, there was quite a bit of investment back in 2007. And then through the financial crisis, it dropped. And then it really started again in 2014-15. This is actual equity investment by venture capitalists in startups or mergers and acquisitions in of, of companies. And you know, people might think of PayPal uh, or Square or Stripe as being some of the largest fintech companies. What's interesting is you can see that the number of deals has actually declined as money is being concentrated in a few winners. So the market seems to evolve from really early stage startup companies to investing at a later stage in a few successful so-called unicorns that are companies that have over private companies with over a billion dollars of valuation. This chart shows that around the world, there are uh, close to 40 fintech unicorns. And you may not have heard their names, they're not really household names yet. But you can see uh, in, in the United States, we do know Stripe, and if you're in the, in the crypto space, you would know Coinbase, which is uh, a major uh, player in that. But there will be other companies that you may not have heard of, such as Credit Karma, Robinhood, or Plaid. And you can see that in North America, the names that are coming out are TransferWise, which is a foreign exchange transfer or remittance business. Uh, Revolut, which started up as being just a, a credit card and is now a, they're, they're a startup that's trying to provide a, a variety of financial services. And in particular, you'll see that China is, lead, is leading in a lot of this. Um, and the companies that come to mind in this space you don't see Alibaba or Tencent here, but Ant Financial or Alipay is one of the biggest fintech companies, and WePay or and um, payments and and from those companies are certainly massive players. Okay. And they've been pushing a lot of innovation in this space. Okay. In Canada, we're doing our best to to grow these startups. Um, this is just one. You know, a series of, of names or logos across a bunch of different business lines. There's probably around 750 startups in the fintech space, which compares to about 300 a couple of years ago. Um, at Ivy, actually, what we've been doing is we've been trying to, to, to help students as well as investors learn about these companies. We have a website called Canada Fintech, where we've basically been profiling different startups across different business lines. So you can see here, for example, under crowdfunding, which um, you know we you could click on any of these front funder or chimp or catapult, and you would find a description of the company, who their founders are, the money they've raised, and their products and services. And what we find is that the vast majority of the Canadian fintechs, come on in, um, are based in uh, Toronto, Vancouver, and and Montreal. Uh, the average company is around seven years old, has about 90 employees, and has raised around $30 million. Okay. Um, the, the vast majority, well, not the majority, about one quarter of all the fintechs and Canadians have started are in the payment space. This is something that, believe it or not, Canada is quite far ahead of other countries, you know, and that's because of our system of Interact and Monoris using our tap and go and our. Um, we actually have a lot of expertise in those spaces that is not uh, available necessarily in the United States or Europe. And a lot of people have left those companies to do, to do that. But blockchain, there's set, you know, 17 startups on our list. Uh, lending and credit, also 17. Yeah, Joe? I got a interruption. Yeah. Um, so, so far you have shown us a picture. There are so many smaller players in different yeah. niche market. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a big one going to kind of take them them all and no actually what's what's interesting is that I've showed you a bunch of smaller players but I haven't talked about what the the big incumbents are doing namely the big five Canadian banks the big insurance companies and the big asset managers um, what what we're seeing is we're seeing a bunch of startups on one side and then we're seeing a, a large amount of investment within big institutions on the other and uh, whereas in in the United States for example there's much more uh, partnerships between startups and the big banks. In Canada, our, our financial institutions are taking much more of a go-it-alone strategy and developing everything in-house. 
and then you have a bunch of startups who are trying to compete against them. And have, they face problems of scale, uh, cost of acquiring customers, uh, and difficulty of getting stable funding. And so some of them are actually now going uh, to the United States uh, because they're finding that there's, you know, there's more familiarity with these with their business models. There's more experimentation amongst consumers than you find with Canadians. Canada's adoption at the household level is quite low. It's around 15%. Um, you know, just asking here, yeah. Could that be partly might, because of the estates might be more deregulated too in the banking sector? Yeah, I mean, some of these businesses are regulated uh, very peculiarly in Canada. They're, you know, they're regulated at the provincial level uh, by the Securities Commissions. Uh, they may be facing uh, federal regulation in Canada by the, the body that does money laundering called FinTrack. Um, and it's very expensive to comply with all these different levels of regulation. Whereas in the United States, there seems to be more of a more of a um, um, hands-off approach. The UK and Europe are really moving far ahead in this in these spaces. And needless to say, China actually is is like a leader in a lot of this, but in a very different way. Actually, I'll talk about. Um, so people now have really heard 